uh, well, good morning, everybody. Um, glad that you could participate in this call. Um, one of the things that, uh, or I guess kind of a little bit of backstory to this webinar, um, we'd asked uh, Robbie as the representative of the American Rambouillet Sheep Breeders Association to form a little small committee to um, provide a little bit of a, of a kind of an oversight or an advisory board to our genetics and breeding program at the, the Texas a AgriLife Research and Extension Center in San Angelo. Uh, we have a, a registered Rambouillet flock there that uh, we're doing research with. Uh, primarily looking at next generation breeding technology. And um, as we were talking about what we were doing and how we could communicate what we're doing and how to get uh, people aware and their ability to maybe um, collaborate with us with what's going on and, and see those kind of technologies and learn from it, uh, we came up with uh, hosting this little webinar to kind of go over the things that we're doing and what we see is in the future of next generation sheep breeding technology. Jake Thorne is going to be speaking as well today. Jake is an extension associate. Um, he is, is leading all the grunt work for all the sheep breeding technology, um, not only in the grunt work, but a lot of um, the capacity work as well. So Jake is going to talk about some of the genomic stuff, um, but I'm just going to go through and kind of give a, an overview of where I see sheep breeding technology, where we've been and kind of where we're going. Um, I always kind of like to think big picture. Uh, well, if y'all were involved or saw the American Sheep Industries Convention this past year, their theme for it was reverence for the past, innovation for the future. And so I really like that uh, theme. Uh, we, you know, we, I, we need to remember where we've been. We don't want to repeat history unless it was a good thing, uh, but we also need to be looking forward. So I kind of wanted to use that theme as we get started here with sheep breeding technology. So as we think about reverence for the past, um, you know, the, the initial stages of genetic selection with sheep, um, you know, go back thousands and thousands of years ago. And basically everything's always been, or was began upon visual grading. So we look at the animals, evaluate them, and make genetic selection decisions. Uh, the benefits of visual grading animals is it's, you know, it's cheap. You may need a, a pair of, uh, glasses if your eyesight is fading but you know other than that most people have the visual ability to look at animals and assess um, some characteristics of them there's pretty simple predictors for size of the animals you know how big they're going to get uh, their structural correctness uh, the amount of muscle mass they're going to have on the body especially in you know the leg uh, kind of shoulder region uh, we can still see a lot of the muscle down down the top as well uh, wool quality, um, so we can look at the wool, determine how fine it's likely to be. Uh, there are tools that are better able to quantify that now. And then we can also uh, see attributes, um, things like horns or poles, um, you know, open-faced or closed-faced, um, you know, defects that they may have, something like an undershot jaw or an overshot jaw or you know, entropian, things like that, that are, that are heritable, and we can be easily see those. The negatives to relying on visual grading alone is we just can't see certain traits without measuring them. Uh, we cannot see reproduction and fertility, especially like when we're looking at a ram, like Jake's holding this ram here. You know, we don't know uh, what his mother's performance was, how many lambs she's raised, if he was a single or a twin, um, you know, if they're early maturing, late maturing, uh, you know, all those type of things, we just can't see those, uh, nor can we see parasite resistance in an animal. Um, you know, yes, you could see if it's anemic, but you don't know what the pasture conditions were like that led to that. Um, if they were on feed and in a pen, it's very unlikely they're going to have a parasite challenge. Um, or anything like that. So you just can't see those. And to be real honest, in the commercial world, those are the two most important factors. They've got to raise multiple lambs and um, they have to be fit for their environment. And then also when we're just looking at them, it's hard to deal with antagonistic traits like wool quality and wool quantity. If we just select for fine wool, um, they generally don't produce as much of it. And so we have to select for two traits that are antagonistic at the same time. And those are just very difficult to do when we're just visually grading. Um, 
visual grading has led to exhibition. So showing sheep, um, I'm sure many of you that have um, that may watch this uh, webinar have shown animals and exhibition. Um, you know, this is a, a genetic selection means where it's not just your opinion, but you're bringing in the opinion of a judge or multiple judges. Um, the benefits of this is it's a great marketing opportunity. You know, everybody likes a, a national champion or a descendant of a national champion. Um, so it's marketing for your, your animals. It's a great opportunity to network and, and, you know, get to know other breeders that are out there. It's an excellent youth development program. Um, you know, our youngsters love to show and compete. And so when we exhibit animals and, and uh, rank them in a, in a show ring, it gives us that ability. The negatives to it is generally outliers win banners. And, you know, in the commercial sheep world, outliers, you may need those to make a genetic shift or a genetic change. But in reality, what people really want to see is consistency. Um, you know, a consistent production of a certain phenotype that they can manage around. Um, you know, when we get into the exhibition ring, it's very subjective to the eye of the judge. So whatever their fancy fits is what wins. And, you know, just to be real honest about it, it's, it's a lot of opinions without a whole lot of facts. Um, you know, if you go and, and listen to a judge talk about things like, you know, spring of rib and how that's going to correlate to lifetime productivity, there's no scientific studies that have been done that really measure spring of rib and relate that to lifetime production. So I'm not saying it's absolutely false, but it's, a, it's a, an indication that we think might be there, but we're in a world where we can measure things. So why not measure them? Um, you know, one of the things that, that I always kind of think about is, um, you know, like especially for like reproduction and reproductive fitness. So two breeds of sheep that are known for extremely high reproductive capabilities are the Finn sheep and the Romanoff. And they are the exact opposite of what a judge would select for, for, you know, big, wide bodied, uh, you know, they're narrow fronted, they're fine boned. Uh, I'm not saying they're a superior breed, but you know, sometimes we just got to really stop and think. And, you know, often I think whenever we get into an exhibition standpoint, we're building upon what others have communicated to us as what we should be breeding for. And it's, it's generally without a lot of facts. And so sometimes I can be kind of too negative on the show ring. I mean, I, I, it, the show ring developed a passion for the sheep industry for me, but sometimes we also have to think, um, think big and not just let others and what's gone on in the past dictate how we, how we go in the future. Uh, central performance testing. Um, this is um, 70 plus year old technology. The Texas A&M Research Center in San Angelo, up until a couple of years ago, it hosted a test. Um, you know, nearly 70 years we held this centralized test. You know, the advantage of centralized tests is you bring animals all into the same area. They're all under the same environment. We get this cross flock comparison. Uh, we can really select for maximal fleece value. And we saw this through that 70 years of testing. Um, you know, the animals produced a lot of wool. Uh, it was pretty good quality. And at the same time, those animals were growing really fast. Um, they were gaining up to a pound a day while still producing sub 20 micron wool. Um, you know, and so we did a really good job of, of breeding fast growing sheep that had really good wool on them. The downside is, is, is we'll get to that in a minute, but it's just not the same environment where those females are raised. Um, the other positive to this is it, it's limited effort by the consigners. So you don't have to do a lot of data collection on farm. You don't have to have a large operation with big contemporary groups or things like that. You just raise a ram and bring it to somebody and they tell you how good it did off of a performance test. So that's good by the consigner, but I think long-term it's not the best um, best option because we're missing data that we could really use and we'll get to that later. So the negatives, uh, definitely an artificial environment, everything's out of a feed buck. Um, and, you know, in the commercial world, there's very few commercial operations that make a living with animals eating out of a feed buck on a year round basis. So we need to performance test animals in the environment that they fit, which is generally the pasture in Texas. Uh, we can't measure reproduction again here. Um, no parasite assessment was occurring in these tests and they're rather costly. 
uh, I think we were charging close to $350 to test the RAM. And unfortunately that, you know, adds quite a bit of cost that you have to pass on to uh, the commercial operator that buys those RAMs from you in the future. So um, if you really like what was going on and you think, oh, if everything was good back in the good old days, we'd all be better. Well, the good old days, we've got a lot of sheep. And so over the past 20 years, the red line shows our land crop in the U.S. over the last 20 years minus the last four. Um, but it didn't start going the other way. So now I'm not blaming this all on genetics. There's a lot of factors that are involved in it. But if you're on a downward trajectory, you ought to stop and rethink, okay, are we, should we be having so much reverence for what's been going on or should we be looking at ways to change? Now you might say, well, we're, not, we're producing less animals because there's less demand for that product. There's just not a lot of people that eat lamb. Well, if you look over the past 40 years, uh, lamb consumption has actually gone up in the U.S. Um, the bars, whether they're green or yellow, combined total from 1980 to 2019 here, have actually slightly improved. Um, the green part of those bars is the domestic production, and the yellow part is lamb imports. And so in the last 30 years, essentially, we've been producing less and less lamb, and the American consumers are sourcing that from imports. Now, granted, the imports are slightly cheaper, um, and that's, you know, cost of production is a big thing, or cost to, to consume the product from consumer level is a big point. And, you know, we import all kinds of goods, not just lamb, but um, there's opportunity to maintain that market share if we think about improving efficiency and think about providing that product uh, to the American consumer. Um, I'm a big, big believer in quantitative genetics. I think this is probably the, the lowest hanging fruit that's out there for us um, to take advantage of because it's proven, it's available, it's right here. But it's really, uh, I'm putting this in the innovation for the future category, but in reality, it's 40 year old technology. Um, it has improved some over the 40 years, but not exponentially. I mean, it's, it's you know, fairly similar to what it was, maybe just a little bit more robust. So quantitative genetics very, very simply is farm and ranch performance data that's turned into breeding values. So we take ranch data, put it in the breeding values, and they're very robust. Uh, the advantages for it is we measure the animals in whatever environment you put them in, and so we find those that are fit to it. There's a wide range of traits that we measure that kind of encompass everything that the Rambouillet sheep is known for, growth, wool, parasite control, reproduction, health, um, all those things really get kind of measured by this program. Um, and it's fairly low cost. Uh, most flocks of say, you know, 100 animals may only spend um, the same amount of money that they would have taken to put two animals on a performance test, yet they're getting genetic predictors on an entire, uh, on all the animals in their flock. And so the cost is not there. The negative for it, it requires effort. Um, you need to collect data. Uh, most registered operations, they know pedigree, so they've got that data, data already. Um, and then beyond that, just need to collect some weaning weights, some post weaning weights, some yearling weights, um, some fleece data, uh, some parasite resistance, some fecal accounts at strategic times. Um, and once you collect those, you kind of need to learn how to put them into a a software program, send them off, get the data interpreted, generated into breeding values. And then, uh, you know, the big negative right now, because this technology has not been available, most of the commercial industry does not really seek out these breeding values. They really don't understand exactly what they are. That's a big part of what we're doing is trying to educate um, the commercial and the seed stock sector on what these values mean and how to interpret them and how to use them. So just as an example here, um, U lifetime productivity data. Um, this is, uh, you know, I think one of the biggest things that we should look at. Uh, we started this Rambouillet flock on the NSIP in 2015. And so the first U base, uh, the yearling U's were 2013 born. Um, and so now we've been in production for basically six lamb crops. We have five of those measured. And so this um, data here, this, this 
series of data is is five ewes out of that 2013 lamb crop that started lambing in 2015. And so one of the simple things that you can look at here is just progeny. So this, this ewe right here, 8993, has had four progeny in five lambing opportunities. Okay, so one year she didn't raise the lamb. The other, um, the other four years she raised a single. The next ewe raised six, eight, nine, nine, nine. This 903 raised five, this 9019 raised seven, and 9026 raised seven. And so, you know, I think from a commercial person's perspective, if, if you're looking at this and buying rams to produce females, right? And so those females, if they were all generating around seven lambs in five years versus four, that's a huge difference in net return. Um, you know, those, those lambs generate probably 85% of the, the flock performance. And so if we can increase that by 60 or 70% from a lower base, we can have a big impact. Um, now you come over here, this is number of lambs born. Jake, y'all could see my cursor the, uh, here. Yeah. Okay. So this is number of lambs born. So uh, progeny kind of is what's measured, but really the thing that you ought to be looking at is number of lambs born breeding values. So this negative 10 is indicating that this U is 10% below um, the breed average, right? Whereas the U that has seven and seven, this one's 12% above breed average. And then the other one is 6%. So it's not just on their performance, it's the performance of all related offspring and their progeny. So that's why these are different. Uh, but it's easy to tell that, that their performance data has a big influence on what this breeding value is. And so I don't know if your Zoom thing is covering this up or not, but the darker one is Sire, and then the lighter one that's set off is Dam. And what you'll notice is, is the two ewes here that both raised seven lambs were sired by 8803. And so when we went back and look at the taste flock, this 8803 was our best performing sire for generating females that were more productive, reproductively fit. Whereas this 8762 generally had females that produced lower lamb crops. And so you know, without this type of robust technology, it's very hard to navigate through all of the details in their pedigree and pull these things out. And so a person could, but breeding values just make it a whole lot simpler. So if we look at the 2019 lamb crop, um, this is uh, 12,844. Um, we don't have a lot of data on it yet, just because we haven't collected a lot of it. But if we look over here, this is her sire or her dam this 8993 okay um now these and that's this one up here that only raised four progeny these that raised seven and this lamb crop both raised the set of twins right? and so you just see how much more productive they are this is 9019 9019 9026 9026 so those are those two use right there and this last current lamb crop now we'll note that their first lamb crop everybody raised a single and so, you know, now we can look back at that first lamb crop and those, if we had kept those genetics and know what their general reproductive performance is. And here's one of them, wasn't our first, this nine, uh, 8993, I think it was our second or third lamb. But this lamb here, 9269, which is a 2017 born ewe, we still have her in the flock. Um, last year she raised a single lamb, but it was a really, really nice, uh, she's a really nice you. You look at her growth potential, three, this is in the top percent for growth in our flock, 8.5 for yearling weight, one of the largest framed, uh, biggest animals. But look at the fleece data on this one, 32% above breed average for grease fleece weight. Um, microns around zero, staple links, a positive 10. So if we didn't have this reproductive uh, breeding value, you would just automatically be drawn to one of these animals. And one of these animals would perform very well on a centralized performance test because it's looking for growth and wool production. 
But the bad thing is, is often that may be negatively correlated with, with reproduction. So we got to fit all those things together. Parasites is a big deal, um, but parasites is really complicated. How to get it collected. Um, here's some data that I just recently collected from a cooperator that we're working with. These are first time lambing ewes at one year of age. And so they're yearling ewes. Um, and the lambs were about 45 days old when we measured the lambs. Um, and that's on the early stage of a parasite challenge. And so the blue bars is the average fecal egg count for the group. The green is the minimum and the red is the maximum within that group. And so the lambs um, only averaged 41 eggs per gram. We really need to be above a thousand, um, at minimum above 500 on average to be able to quantify anything and pick out any highs and lows. But if you just went through and grabbed some samples from the ewes and tried to find which ones were, um, you know, superior or not, and you didn't know which ones are raising lambs and which ones are raising singles or twins, you know, let's just go through and say you found a ewe that was had 1500 eggs per gram. Well, um, 1500 eggs per gram, if she's dry, is actually above average. So that would get a, um, a positive fecal egg count breeding value, which is not good because we want a lower fecal egg count, right? Because that average is at 1200. Whereas if the U was raising a lamb, um, the average was 2300 because they had the demand to lactate. Um, and you know, these, uh, anything below 2300 would be getting a negative value. We actually had one ewe that was raising a lamb uh, very well and only had 300 eggs per gram. You know, this is kind of superior genetics, but you have to fit that in with all the other breeding values as well. Um, some of them were raising twins, they weren't broken out, but generally the twins are a little bit higher. But I guess my point is on all this, is this is all very challenging for a person to navigate through all this data and try and find, you know, twin born, big fleas, fine wool, parasite resistant in contemporary groups. And so it all gets challenging. Um, and what, what quantitative genetics and breeding values do is it simplifies it all to one number for each trait. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Jake here in just a second, but uh, molecular genetics is next stage. That's what we're working on um, as we're also looking to improve quantitative genetics. I'll back up to one of this parasite fitness. The reason I didn't show you breeding values for this is we're just now getting breeding values turned on for the range breeds or the fine wool breeds. Um, they were not turned on before. They were only available to hair sheep. Um, and so we're, we're just now getting all that finished up. Um, later this summer uh, and fall, we should be getting breeding values um, from all this data that we're collecting of this fecal egg count data. And Jake's uh, the leading force behind all that. <laughs> so molecular genetics, um, again, instead of measuring things, we just measure the DNA and let it tell us what's going to happen. The advantage is this is it's very accurate for very simple traits. Jake will kind of go through this. Um, it's, uh, it increases accuracy for unproven animals, kind of like those females, you know, when they go through, you need their lifetime production to really get it. Uh, and there's, there's some endless opportunities as we figure this out, but it's very complicated, very complex, a lot of genes to really go through. The negatives is it's quite expensive. Um, and it requires, this is a big one, it requires performance tested animals. And to be honest, in the Rambouillet breed, we're one of the few people that are registered that are collecting a lot of this. There's a few others around. Uh, Matt Benz is doing this. There's a few folks in South Dakota um, and, and a few other places around the U.S., but it's very limited. And we need a lot more animals performance tested or this genomics isn't going to really um, do us a lot of good. And if you think you're going to wait for someone else to do all the performance testing and develop the genetic uh, code, and you're just going to take advantage of that later on. So far, that's not worked out. If you're not genetically linked and very well tied into that database, this molecular genetic stuff really isn't all that predictive. But uh, anyways, Jake, take it away and tell us a little bit more about what some, some of this molecular genetics could do for us. Sure. Uh, so 
you know, you, we already touched on both of these genetic selection types of technologies. And I, I have a couple slides here that I wanted to break it down just a little bit further uh, to explain how these estimated breeding values and how genomics uh, sort of work. And so quantitative genetics, NSIP, uh, or you know, breeding values are, are something that you, you've probably have, have undoubtedly heard about. But how, how do we come about getting a, a breeding value? And so as Reed sort of alluded to, that you know, we're trying to eliminate the environmental impact. And so we've, we've seen this equation before. You know, phenotype, how an animal looks or, or things we can measure are determined by its genetics and the environment it's raised in. And so in quantitative genetics, what we're really trying to do is, in, is eliminate uh, that environmental component. I'm not sure I can get my slide to. There we go. And so we do that by comparing animals within contemporary groups. And so contemporary groups are, are those that have been raised similarly, experienced the same um, environment, be feed or weather, which would be obvious ones, but even in simple things, as, such as exposed to the same diseases, exposed, uh, you know, born during the same season, all these different components that can impact how an animal uh, may be developed. And so once we eliminate that environmental component, then we can measure those phenotypes. Reproduction, growth, wool quality are all important ones, uh, obviously, to the Rambouillet breed. And then we arrive at, man, you know, then we arrive at that estimated breeding value. And that's that number that we can you know, basically calculate on the geno a genetic impact uh, of that animal. So uh, on a completely different end of the spectrum, there's genomics. And, and so genomics is where instead of calculating the genetic impact, we're going to actually look at the DNA and the, the actual gene structures them themselves. So we'll take tissue from those animals. Uh, we'll, we know where specific genes are located on the genome, and we can look at the variants of those genes and how they're correlated to specific phenotypes. And this is not, you know, obviously a technology that's just specific to sheep or livestock. Um, undoubtedly, you've heard about this. I mean, 23andMe is genomic technology. Uh, genomics is very popular in a lot of our pets and other animals that we, we deal with. And so uh, it's a very broad spectrum type technology, and we're only really just getting started using this in livestock effectively. And uh, again, you have you've probably have been exposed to the scrapey type um, you know, genotypes or alleles, the RR versus QR versus QQ. Those, that's, that's genomic technology, whereas we know which variant of the specific gene, uh, PRNP, that is associated with scrapie resistance or susceptibility. It's a simple inherited trait. Uh, that gene controls just that one trait. And, you know, you, we've been able to really reduce the incidence of scrapie based off selecting for um, resistant animals. And so that's where that RR um, and QQ alleles kind of are derived from. Another trait that you probably have heard of uh, um, is, you know, horn pole. That's another trait that's controlled by a single gene. Genomic technology is really good at identifying those types of situations. So what's available to producers out there in the world of genomics? Well, there's actually lots of varying levels. Um, there's whole genome sequencing, quite literally, where we look at the entire genetic structure of a particular animal and compare it to a reference genome, uh, which is a genome or a, a basically a genetic map that has been constructed for that breed or that species. There's also a 660K chip and a 50K chip, and those are panels that look at um, for SNPs, which are single nucleotide polymorphisms or markers for specific gene variants at either 660,000 or 50,000 spots across the genome. But in all reality, you know, whole genome sequencing and these two higher density chips are much for, more for research type purposes. They're a little bit more expensive. There's a lot of information in them. And so more from a, a commercial sector, what's available to the producer right now are some low density options. And these are uh, a thousand and under marker panels. Uh, they cost about $20 and um, you've probably have, have seen them before. Flock 54 is a common one 
um, that has been released in the, within the last two years. Also, NeoGen is another company that offers this type of technology. And these low density panels, they can offer you parentage information. Uh, they can offer you these horn pulled scraper resistance, OPP resistance, spider lamb, rickets, these certain genes or certain diseases or, or conditions that are controlled by a, a single gene. Uh, because we have been able to identify those specific genes that are important for that type of disease or condition. There's also some high impact fecundity variants on those panels. And so in, in the world of fecundity or, or, or litter size, there's particular gene variants that can have, um, can really increase litter size or really decrease litter size. They're not the only genes that affect litter size, but they do have um, a particularly high impact. And on Flock 54 and the NeoGen type panel, they can test for these. Um, a, a one that you may have I've heard of is the Barula gene. That is a particular variant that increases litter size by almost an entire lamb uh, for each copy of that variant that that animal has. And so we can test for those types of things. But with all that being said, really where, where this technology can really be applied and really be beneficial is once we understand the genomic impact to measure polygenic traits or those traits that are controlled by many genes. And these genes or these traits are typically those that are really affect our bottom line, the production type traits. Reproduction as a whole, parasite resistance as a whole is controlled by many different genomic factors. And we're still in, in the world of research working on that and figuring out what those weights uh, for each of those types of gene variants are. Because the goal is to really incorporate these two technologies together. And so, you know, if we had a couple of rams and they each had an estimated breeding value for whatever trait um, that was similar to, to each other, you know, that's calculated that they are basically the same, but that doesn't necessarily mean that if we looked at their DNA, that they would have the same DNA structure or same gene structure that has led to that similar breeding value. Um, in some instances, you know, a particular ram might have uh, a one variant of a gene um, and not another, and the other ram, you know, could be a complete opposite. And even though, you know, calculated, as being um, the same impact on that trait. In this case, we're looking at number of lambs born. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that that's all derived from the same gene component. And so once we understand those different variants and how to calculate those weights, I mean, the goal is to you know, combine genomic technology and quantitative technology to uh, ultimately lead to these genomically enhanced breeding values. And that's something that you know, it's not offered to producers right now. Um, as I mentioned, you know, research-wise, we're still working through this. But in, in other livestock species, genomically enhanced breeding values are very popular and have been very beneficial, particularly in the dairy world, uh, but even in the beef cattle world, you know, in, um, in, in the Angus breed, you can go right now and look on the, their website and there'll be a list of you know, genomically enhanced breeding values or genomically enhanced traits uh, where um, you know, this, this type of technology has been applied and, and really been beneficial. And that's something that we want to push and, and hopefully target uh, in, our, in our sheep breeds. Thanks, Reed. All right, thanks, Jade. So um, got a couple more slides here to kind of bring this back to today. Um, and, and then we'll kind of get y'all's thoughts on it, on some things. To me, um, I think the sheep industry is, is beyond the crossroads. Um, where we're at today, um, just going to be honest with you, um, and, you know, be glad to um, have someone argue with me and we can cuss and discuss things. But for the most part, and this is not unique to the Rambouillet breed, but across all breeds, is registered sheep are extreme versions of their uh, commercial cousins. Um, and to the degree that I don't know that a lot of commercial operations are wanting those registered sheep unless they have a big demand to change in the direction that the registered sheep's extreme uh, phenotype fit for it. Um, as such, there's just not a, there's a pretty limited demand for registered sheep outside the show ring. Um, I don't get commercial operations calling me, asking me where to get a registered animal 
for, you know, registered Ram Blay Ram or Dorper Ram, you know, in contrast, I get people call and say, where do I get a good commercial one? And I don't want one that's been registered and pampered. Now, I'm not saying that they're exactly right. I'm just telling you that's the sentiment that, that I get from the commercial side. So um, if we want to change that focus and get back to where registered animals um, have a lot of value in the commercial world, there needs to be some big shifts in standard operating procedures and the way that they're done. They're gonna, it, I don't think you're gonna see a, a little bit of effort um, in one direction, but kind of sticking with the way we've done things in the past, things are gonna change. I think we're at a point where it's gonna need some pretty big paradigm shifts to change focus and go in a different direction. Or not a different direction, but go in a, in a, a performance oriented direction. So I think it, there's gonna need to be a big focus on it. Um, if not, the commercial producers will continue to source their genetics elsewhere or they'll just continue to raise their own replacements. And we really aren't seeing any genetic progress or improved genetic uh, fitness of the animals that are out in the commercial world. Um, but I, I do think that with these new genetic technologies coming along online that are completely available and developing, that it's the opportunity. It's that opportunity knocking on the door to rechange and refocus on where we're going with a seed stock sector providing genetics to the commercial world. And so, you know, the, the, the next question is, do you wanna take on this opportunity? Um, you know, as a breed association, as a member of that breed association, as a seed stock breeder, um, or do you, or do you wanna just stick with the way things are going? And maybe you're different than um, from what I've seen and you've got a great clientele base of commercial operations that are buying Rams for you. And, and I hope that you do, uh, but that's not what I'm seeing. And so from a breed association standpoint, if you wanna take the bull by the horn, so to speak, and use this opportunity, um, I think you need to acknowledge that the opportunity exists and make it very uh, aware to the membership and the breeders that this is here and we see value in it. Um, with that, I think there's going to need to be support provided to the breeders, basically education uh, as to what the technology is, how to use it, how we can uh, use it to their best benefit, and then also from a data management standpoint. The way the National Sheep Improvement Works Program works right now is the bulk of all the work lays on the seed stock producer. So they've got to collect all the data, they've got to put all the data into a software program, manage that software program, submit that data to the uh, sheep genetics in Australia, you know, then they get the data back and they have to re-import it into it. And, and so everything is done by that person. Whereas if you look in the beef industry, the breed associations provide all of that for them. So as soon as you register an animal, as soon as you, you know, do that, you send in the data, the breed association manages a bunch of it. So there's an advantage to the breed association doing it because then you don't have to train everyone, all of your seed stock breeders to use the technology. The downside is, as I've, I, as I've talked to a lot of um, registered beef operations, they really don't understand as well as the people that are using NSIP and sheep on how contemporary group structures work and how a lot of these things functions because they haven't had to manage it themselves. Um, but, you know, nothing happens without people. Um, and I think that's where you focus. Don't focus on the animals, focus on the people. So who are your early adopters that are going to do it? And there may already be, and I think there are some early adopters doing it um, and how to focus on them. Uh, youth education and support. Uh, one of the things I think it's, it's you know, critical is that as our youth that have an interest in livestock are exposed to this technology. Um, you know, the picture in the bottom right is my son taking part in a, participating in a fraternity. I'd really love to see fraternities have this level of um, breeding values and other things in them so that they grow up around them and they don't have to be, um, you know, brought aware of this in their adult life and it becomes a norm from a youth support development. Um, support groups generally help, you know, groups of people that help each other out um, as they learn how to do things. And as a breed association, commercial outreach. 
you know, that's a big thing we're trying to accomplish is communicate to the commercial industry what the value of this technology is. Uh, but it's, it's kind of for naught if we don't have a supply of seed stock breeders with EBVs. So with that, um, we've still got uh, almost 20 minutes left in the hour here. We're fully committed to help with this technology. Um, we want to do everything that we can uh, to, to be able to assist you, you as breeders, you as a breed association, um, you know, use science and technology to the benefit of the sheep industry. And so I guess with that, Jake, if you've got another thought or a closing comment, you're welcome to add it in here. If not, I'd, I'd love to take questions. Uh, we can go back to different points. You can just straight up argue with me. I, I'm a firm believer if one person's doing, or, you know, if everyone's always agreeing, there's only one person doing the thinking. So, uh, I encourage you to, to challenge me on things or, or bring up questions or thoughts or ideas. Um, I'd love to have those discussions. You may be on, you may have, you have to click off of mute. Um, if you don't have a microphone or something, you should be able to send a chat message in um, and we can look at those. I don't see any, any chat messages in here yet. Um, but questions, comments. Reed, this is Heath Crumley. Good morning. Thank you and Jake for doing this. Uh, you bet. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, one of my questions, um, love the parasite part. And that's of course on the sheep and goats, that's critical for all of us. Was that, um, and this may be not necessarily on the, overall aspect of the NSIP. But on your data there, do you catch that at the highest risk uh, times, like what we've just gone through with early spring, lush forage, low growing, um, that sort of situation? Um, or <clears throat> do you have the opportunity within whatever parameters you want your data to be collected to, uh, maybe look at that at different seasons and different conditions. Depends on all the labor you want to put into it, uh, of course. But that was one of my questions. And then I'll have another one about uh, some breed character opportunities as well. Sure, yeah. Um, parasites, it's challenging because timing is everything um, on that one. Uh, we're learning a lot in the process. We've been collecting these since uh, 2015. Uh, but we don't always get good data every year. Jake, you want to kind of share how we go about collecting uh, fecal egg counts and what works, then work? Absolutely. I, you know, to broadly answer your question, Heath, we can we can collect and you know have useful data basically at any point throughout the year because remember we're when we collect a fecal egg count, we're comparing it to the other members of its contemporary group. But there are some specific conditions and times when collecting that, those egg counts are more beneficial than others. So let's say it's been fairly dry or those animals are in really good condition or both and we, you know, we collect some egg counts and they're really, really low. Well, if there's no variation within that group, then it's really hard to identify those animals that are superior or inferior. So if you know, the group average is 200 and the highest egg count you get is 500 and the lowest is zero, well, there's just not much variability there. On the other end of the spectrum, if you wait until the parasite challenge is too strong, then you, know, you run into some health issues. You also have egg counts that are very, very extreme uh, for everybody. And you know, the same situation arises. Well, you know, is this comparison fair? You know, is this animal truly resistant to parasites when it has an egg count of over 10,000? Know, that, that becomes tough. So really the ideal conditions, and from NS, NSIP's perspective too, is when the group average uh, for that contemporary group is somewhere between 500 and 1,000. And what you get in those situations are, uh, you know, typically 75, 80% of those animals will be at that group average or even a little bit below it. 
but there will be a certain percentage of that group, 10% or, 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 or so, that are four to five times that average. And this is the, the perfect opportunity to identify those that are inferior for that trait and, because those are the reservoir animals that are basically, you know, really the ones that are sp spreading those worms to all the others. And I, you know, read, scoot it back to this slide here. And, and you can see that, you know, these, these extremes, 4,200, 2,400, those would be those reservoir animals that I mentioned. I, I don't know what the average is amongst everybody, um, but you know, for the ewes that have lambs, uh, you know, 2,300, 1,200 for the drive you, dry ewes, uh, and then we get some that are, are, are double that. Um, you know, this, is, this would be a good time to collect that information. This is a, an appropriate time to be able to identify you know, those that are better or worse for that particular trait. This happened to be just a few weeks ago, so right in the middle of um, our quote-unquote parasite season, but uh, you know that really whenever those averages are at that appropriate benchmark level is, is when you can make those comparisons. Yeah, this the, the one on the right here that was coming off the dry use, that's where we would like to see the lambs at when you wean them. Um, just kind of a moderate challenge. Uh, then you wean them. Typically, the best practice is to drench them all, clean them all out, start them on a new plan, and then wait um, 60 days, 30 to 60 days, and then you'll see something similar to this. Um, the, the best heritability is in the post-weaning weight, so around 120, 150 days of age. Uh, but if you let those wean lambs go to this category, those young lambs that haven't really had a chance to develop an immunity to it yet, you can get some real animal suffering um, and animal loss, animal welfare issues on your hands. And so um, it, it's, it's something that you probably need to learn to do some fecal egg counts at home so you can grab some random samples here or there and watch that. And then when those samples go up, then you collect everybody. The post weaning time period is the, is the most simple from our perspective for eliminating that environmental effect. If you, you know, collecting egg counts at weaning is um, or can be useful information, but you know, generally speaking, you've got some older lambs versus some younger ones. Those older ones have started to nibble on grass longer uh, than those other lambs. And there's just a lot of, uh, you know, environmental, um, factors that can influence that egg count. You've got the milking ability of the ewe, nutritional status, all these things go in. But that post-weaning category, you know, once you've weaned them and those lambs have been, you know, particularly if they have been drenched or are treated for parasites, they've all been treated the same nutritionally, that 60 day later window egg count is, is a great time to get a good comparison amongst everybody. You Does mentioned something real quick about the twin, the twin ewes having a higher count. That was something that kind of stood out to me. Is that because of uh, additional consumption and, and metabolic process? Or why would they have necessarily a higher parasitic count just because they're eating more and milking more? Yeah, they're, they're, they're producing 30% more milk than a ewe with a single. And so that you know, the body is always a give and a take. And so, you know, does it, does it fuel lactation? Does it fuel its own? Cause these are ewe lambs, they're still growing. Does it fuel their own uh, maturation and growth or does it fuel the immune system? And so, you know, they can only eat in a certain amount of feed. You might breed animals that eat more feed, but those that have 30% higher milk production are generally going to funnel uh, more of their feed resources away from the immune system. Gotcha. So it's going to be up there. Now gotcha. there's, there's outliers there that can do both how they do it. I don't understand that naturally, but, uh, but yeah, the, the, the use with twins will definitely do more, but it won't be to the extreme, you know, the dry use here, these actually were pregnancy scanned. So they gave, they, they more than likely gave birth in the pasture to a lamb and lost it. So they still had the demand to do gestation, to gestate that lamb, uh, but, um, but didn't raise it. So then they didn't have lactation. If they'd have been just straight dry and never bred, they would probably have been a whole lot lower than this. But anyways, hopefully that answered your question. If not, 
feel free to ask for clarification. It, it answered everything I could could think of. If somebody else had something else they wanted to ask on that topic, I should yield the floor. I'm a little bit worried. Robbie and Russell are being very silent and quiet, and that just really bothers me. Um, <laughs> going to Sorry, Heath, we're just listening. <laughs> the other thing I wanted to ask, and I'm, I'm pretty sure I know the answer, but if you wanted to expand on it, um, different breed uh, associations are going to have different characteristics that are that are critical, or maybe um, let's call it contemporary issues, but you you can test for polled and, and horned of course and some and some fleece uh characteristics of fineness and and staple length within our breed of rambolet or delay merino or but what about um there's a couple of things like color um you know you see the dorsets and how they can pop up a lot of different uh, color variations and in, in input um how would we go about looking at something in that regard um for some of our um, wool breeds and some of the characteristics that we're trying to uh, really keep a good close eye on. So color by, by like yellow wool or like black spots? Black spots more so, uh, yeah. black spots or, or just off color from the, the entire um, selection and, and breed character that we're, we're selecting for. <laughs> No, I mean, you can never get away from, from visually assessing some of those things and culling animals that have, um, you know, black spots and things. Now, there is a marker for a black gene, um, you know, and, and I've actually got some sheep that started having black lambs and big black spots. Um, I need to get this uh, genetic analysis to bring it back to find it um, in that line. I did talk to the breeder I got it from, and they did... Uh, admit that there was some black genes back there but it, you know I don't know that genomics is going to catch all those you know those some of those things you're just going to have to you know um, visually assess and call for um, you know I I I don't mind the solid black gene being in there there's actually a pretty good market for some of those lambs uh, you know it's the spotted ones that, that that you know they need to be all black or all white but um, but yeah, I mean, so some of those characteristics, um, you know, they're not measured, you know, the undershot jaw is not a quantitative or a molecular, hopefully maybe one day molecular, we can predict that, um, you know, entropian's not there. Belly wool, I mean, belly wool can, can crawl up the side. Color of wool is not in there. That's something um, that a lot of folks that have brought some high performing wool genetics out of the Intermountain West into Texas. And there's some definite differences there. Some of them uh, get really yellow in this higher humidity, uh, higher heat um, stress of Texas versus Nevada or Wyoming or wherever they were coming from. So. Well, there always be advancements and, and we'll, we'll, that may be something uh, five, six years down the road that we, we do find a way to measure. So I was just curious. Yeah. No, good question. Russell, did you get your brother up for this? Is it too early for him? No, I couldn't get him up. We're on the way. We're almost to the airport in San Antonio. We're going to go to Kansas to see see Tamara so I had that's that's good this is good listening material for driving <laughs> good <laughs> so well hopefully it didn't you know put how, you how I real. guess I guess one of the things is as a breed association how you know we we try and try and try and encourage participation but but I guess how did how do we move forward with the association on trying to keep them them moving forward and trying to get them to do things like this. And that's probably one of the roadblocks in, in the, the show industry is, is our roadblock as far as our registered association. And, and, you know, I guess that's our problem right now is how, how do we encourage our producers to, to get on this deal and get on this gig and, and, and move forward with it. So, yeah. 
Um, you know, I would think that just uh, actionable items, is, is there a way to include some of this in um, you know, a maturity deal? Right in there. So, um, next, you know, yeah, you can go that something way. Something like that, or we'll stop you know, at, at right there. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, yep, the other strategy could be looking at, um, you know, I don't know how the registration uh, funding mechanism would work or to that degree, but if the breed association would actually be able to support this in, in full force so that just by registering your animals, um, you were able to then put that data in and get those breeding values back. And so it was no added cost. But I, I really don't think cost is the main factor. It's just understanding how it works and, you know, having some incentive to do it because, you know, in, in reality, of it, it it's not a short-term return on investment um, because you're going to sell a few show animals for a lot more money than you're going to sell a few bucks to a commercial breeder and that's just the reality of it um, but you know how can you do both I guess is what I would like to figure out one thing I want to add in is with with genomic technology there is the capability to do some breed identification. And, you know, kind of as it stands right now, you know, red sheep are registered based off of their lineage as being, you know, being from registered animals. But I, I think that there could be some possibility and this, you know, you, you'd have to work with uh, the appropriate people that have this, this type of uh, access to technology and, and capability, but there could, there could be some opportunity to use genomics to, identify Rambouillet sheep and the difference between those animals and other breeds. And, you know, I, I don't want to necessarily open this Pandora's box, but, you know, is there uh, an avenue for somebody to register some sheep that even though they don't necessarily come from uh, a registered lineage on paper, but if they fit into the parameters that are defined as, as being you know, genetically a Rambouillet sheep, if they could join the registry. Um, and, and so that's just something to think about. Uh, uh, there's a few other breed associations and some other species that do something like that. Um, we were, we're working with a, the Spanish Goat Association right now, and that's something that they do. They you know, genomically certify herds based off of you know, if those animals are uh, from DNA, a Spanish goat. And so, uh, I, again, I don't know if that's, that's just a thought to, to consider, but if somebody says, hey, you know, I, I really like what the Rambouillet Registry is doing. I really like the, what they're offering their members as far as, you know, helping them do this, this, and this. I would like to register my sheep, you know, but I don't necessarily, or I'm, three or four generations removed from registered animals. Can I, can I get back into the registry? That may be something that uh, down, the, down the road could be a consideration. This is Heath. I was going to throw a two cent in on that. What about, you know, our RAM testing has gotten so limited because we've closed some, some testing sites and, it, and that expense, like you mentioned, Reed, um, some of this genomic <laughs> testing is a whole lot less than 350 a head uh, you might could expand and have some of that data replace what we've always considered our tested animals and like you said your upper 15 to 20 percent offered as uh, if that's what you're into the show the show sales stuff and what we're looking at is bringing that that next 60% of the flock bring that value up and it sure seems to me like that the NSIP data with the right right marketing and, and support behind it and and like you say if a breed registry can can afford through its membership to support it it sure seems like that might be a, a good replacement for all the testing data that we've done in the past that we don't necessarily have available to us today. Good point. Yeah. Um, 
I've been a, a fairly optimistic at some youth involvement. We've actually worked with uh, the Eden County School was buying some Dorpers from us and um, one of their FFA members, uh, 4-H members is actually going to uh, oversee that and then the science teacher is going to help navigate you know some of the fecal egg count stuff and you know and and use this as a learning tool in their both science and ag classes um and so you know you you're getting that kind of real hands-on learning type stuff so you know i say that just to kind of stimulate thought process i'm not saying that's the exact model we want to go down because i can't you know um mentor a hundred or so different ag operations but as your own operation you know we'd be glad to help you talk with your county agent in that area and see if they have any interest in doing that they're always needing some demonstration projects um you know their youth are always looking for different projects to be in so to where you could get some people involved, other people involved and help out and expand that learning um, opportunities as we're collecting data, evaluating that data, looking at the breeding values that are coming back, so on and so forth. Um, I will also, we're probably running out of time here, we're three minutes past the hour, but I will also say that, you know, we, we view our flock at the research center as a resource flock. So, you know, if you would like to get your RAM connected into our genetic base and into, you know, others and connected these other flocks is, I mean, that's what we're, that's what we view ourselves as being there for. So um, if you want to do more and get more performance testing on your RAMs, we're open um, to taking in outside RAMs and breeding them to a set number of animals compared against other RAMs and things of that such, because you know, that, that's what we're here for. We're here to, to support an industry, not to try and um, do something that others can't. All right. Maybe one last question, if anybody's got anything else. If not, we'll wrap this up. All right. Thanks, everybody. Uh, appreciate your participation. And uh, we'll get this recorded and, and Robert will send us a, a link to it and we'll get it uh, put on YouTube or somewhere and get that to Robbie. And Robbie, if you want to put it on the website, the Ramblay Breeders website, we will be glad to help navigate that. So, Jake, any last thing? All right. If y'all got any follow-up questions or anything, feel free to email us, give us a call, let us know. We'd love to hear from you. Take care.